<laughs> now, good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Cindy Miller, President of the World Affairs Council, and on behalf of the Council, I'd like to welcome you to our distinguished speaker event this evening. I'd like to remind you to silence your phones, please. Uh, the Council would like to thank the Norfolk Commission on the Arts and Humanities for a generous grant in support of this program, and also the Slover Library Foundation for hosting the event. We also would like to thank our corporate sponsors, which includes Penrod, Bay Diesel, and SunTrust Bank. For their support, they've demonstrated a commitment to the community, education, and the global standing of Hampton Roads. Uh, upcoming events on Thursday, March 22nd, in partnership with Old Dominion University and at ODU, we have Ambassador Daniel Freed on the Trump administration, the style and substance of American foreign policy. Tonight, our topic is historically one of the most challenging foreign policy issues for administration, Iran. Our speaker is the founder and current president of the National Iranian American Council and author of several books, including Losing an Enemy, which you can obtain your signed copy tonight if you'd like. Uh, born in Iran, our speaker has escaped political repression in Iran and subsequently excelled in his studies in international relations in Sweden and the United States. He has had a distinguished career working for the Swedish Permanent Mission to the United Nations in New York where he worked on the Security Council, handling affairs of Afghanistan, Iraq, Tajikistan, and Western Sahara. At the UN, he also worked uh, to address human rights uh, in Iran, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and Iraq. Uh, he has been a professor a scholar and a fellow at the John Hopkins University SAIS, the Middle East Institute, and Woodrow Wilson Center for Scholars. Uh, in 2003, two is when you founded the uh, National Iranian American Council, whose stated purpose is dedicated to strengthening the voice of Iranian Americans and promoting greater understanding between the American and Iranian people through expert research, analysis, civic and policy education, and community education. And I was telling him earlier, colleagues of mine in D.C. who are involved in U.S. policy told me, yes, you must have treat us like he's, uh, Dr. Parsi speak because he's a very important voice that you don't hear in the, usually in the administrations. And it's good to have that voice in the debate. So he has great respect by uh, a lot of people in D.C. And he's, uh, in addition to being uh, having published in numerous articles in Middle East Affairs, He's been on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, The Colbert Report, TED Talks, and is a frequent guest on news programs including CNN, the PBS, NewsHour, NPR, BBC, and Al Jazeera. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Trita Parsi. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure being here. Uh, I had no idea I had such a huge fan club uh, in Norfolk. I've actually never been here before. I've always passed by. I take my kids to Virginia Beach at least twice every year. And Norfolk is just one of those places we drive through. So I'm delighted to have the opportunity to come here and, and speak and meet people over here. So I'm delighted about that. The topic of my conversation with you tonight is not going to be as... Well, it's going to be delightful, I'm sure, but it's not going to be as uplifting perhaps because I am going to talk to you all about um, one of the most difficult and challenging foreign policy issues that the United States is dealing with currently and have been dealing with for some time um, and I want to bring uh, a deeper historical understanding of how we have ended up where we are what it took to be able to get this nuclear deal, what it means, and what the consequences of it potentially collapsing would mean. But I do want to go beyond what I'm sure you're all hearing if you're watching the news and all of the talking points for and against. I'm going to go in and explain why this diplomacy actually ended up working against all odds. And I don't know if you're familiar with my previous books. My two previous books also deals with uh, the geopolitics of the Middle East, Iran, the US, and Israel. But I was hoping that this book would be a little bit different. The previous ones were essentially documented the systematic way in which diplomacy had either been neglected or, or missed, and as a result, driving the situation towards a military confrontation. With this one, there was actually what I would call a triumph of diplomacy, clearly not a peace between the United States and Iran, but 
a diplomatic achievement that very few people had expected. And I was hoping that it would be something that would make this book a little bit different. But then after the elections of 2016 and how things have developed, um, I had to rewrite the last chapter of my book and it increasingly started looking like the previous books. Um, but I do want to uh, explain that part of the reason why I wrote this book, I was actually in a rather unique situation during the negotiations. I was an advisor to the Obama administration and a formal advisor. Um, and I also had access to the Iranian side because of my two previous books. I had spent a lot of time with many of their officials doing interviews. So I often, I found myself in a position of being able to talk to both sides and very closely be able to uh, see and understand their concerns, their strategies, their tactics, what they were hopeful about, what they were fearing, and, and the entire dynamics of two countries that haven't talked to each other essentially for 40 years suddenly finding themselves in these negotiations. It wasn't unusual, I could be at the White House early in the week, getting a briefing, and then at the end of the week I would actually be at the talks, serving as an uh, analyst for the media, and ending up having a two-hour private conversation with the Iranian foreign minister. And this really gave me an unparalleled insight into how both sides were viewing this. And I thought I would use this front seat privilege that I had to tell the story of how an international crisis that literally was on the verge of a military confrontation actually was resolved peacefully through diplomacy without a single shot being fired and without a single angry tweet being sent out. And see how we could use that, particularly today when we're dealing with perhaps even more dangerous situations such as that with North Korea. What are the lessons we can learn from actually having engaged in diplomacy with an enemy state in order to ensure that, particularly with North Korea, we don't end up in what surely would be a disastrous military confrontation. Now, when it comes to the nuclear deal itself, I'm sure everyone has heard a lot of different things about it from different angles and is oftentimes focused on the nuclear aspect itself. But I think it's important to understand that this issue went far beyond the nuclear issue. The nuclear issue was a symptom of a much deeper problem. It truly was about the geopolitics of the region, and its consequences ranged from war to peace. And that's where I would like to start. I'd like to take you guys back to April 2012. At a time when the United States was pursuing crippling sanctions against Iran. The Iranians were aggressively going forward with their nuclear program. The Israelis were making regular threats of taking military action. In the midst of that, a most unusual group of people met in a very small European country, uh, far away from the eyes of the cameras. This unusual group included several Iranian diplomats, including two members of the Iranian nuclear negotiating team. It included several American officials, including a rather senior American general. And perhaps most surprisingly, it included five senior Israelis. At a time when the Iranians, the Israelis, did not at all talk to each other, um, if they did, it wasn't anything nice they were saying to each other, it was quite unusual to find these people in the same room. But perhaps most surprising what was actually being said in that small room. I'm going to give you a quote. This was never about enrichment. This is not about enrichment. The room was entirely quiet as the Israeli official looked right across the room into the eyes of the Iranians and uttered these words. And this was quite shocking. For more than two decades, we had heard that Iran's nuclear program particularly its enrichment of uranium, constituted an existential threat to Israel. But now the Israelis themselves were telling the Iranians this was not about enrichment. Instead, he went on and said that Israel liked to see a sweeping attitude change on behalf of Iran, and explained it as such, that Israel could not accept that the Iranians were questioning Israel's right to exist, and could not accept that the United States would come to terms with Iran through any kind of a deal without Iran coming to terms with Israel. If that were to happen, if there was any form of a deal, regardless of its details, it would leave Israel abandoned. 
because the United States would resolve the core element of its tensions with Iran. And it would move on because its responsibilities are global and would be focused on other issues. But Israel would be left in the region alone, facing a hostile Iran, but now without the full backing of the United States. The Israeli official essentially made it clear Israel could not allow this to happen and would do everything in its power to prevent any type of a deal that would lead to a scenario in which the U.S. comes to terms with Iran, but Iran does not at the same time come to terms with Israel. This was not only a moment of clarity, it was a moment of utmost honesty about what actually some of the driving forces of this conflict really was, beyond what you would hear in the talking points on TV. To better understand where the Israelis were coming from and why this geopolitical context matters so much, we need to go back another two decades. Bear with me, but this is important. 1991. The United States uh, defeats, or let me actually back. 1991, you had two major geopolitical shocks. One at the global level with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and one on the regional level because the United States and the UN coalition defeated Saddam Hussein's Iraq. This sends two significant shockwaves. Now the U.S. is the sole superpower, uh, and that changes, of course, the geopolitics of the world. And on a regional level, the old order, the old balance was now gone, but it was not clear what would come to replace it. And it particularly changed the situation for Iran and Israel. Despite the hostility of the Islamic Republic towards Israel, Iran and Israel had been enjoying a secret, rather closed, security collaboration for several decades. It started during the time of the Shah, but continued even in the 1980s. And the driving force of this was that both Iran and Israel shared common security imperatives. Primarily, a fear of the Soviet Union, and second, a fear of strong Arab national states such as Saddam Hussein's Iraq or Egypt's Nasser. And those two were, of course, linked. And these driving forces continued to exist in the 1980s, despite the new regime in Iran. Uh, and it led to a scenario in which some of that collaboration continued. I'm sure everyone in this room remembers the Iran-Contra scandal, an effort by the Israelis back in the 1980s to bring the United States and Iran closer together, and rather absurdly, back in the 1980s, it was the Israelis who were lobbying Washington to talk to Iran, to sell arms to Iran, and not pay attention to Iran's anti-Israeli rhetoric because it wasn't reflective of the actual policy. But by 1991, the two key factors that had driven Iran and Israel closer together had now evaporated. There was no longer a Soviet Union, and there was no longer an Iraq. Instead, you had a new geopolitical constellation in the region, one in which Iran and Israel increasingly emerged as two of the most powerful states in the region. And in the absence of an order, Strong states are drawn into a competition for setting the new balance and setting the new order in the region. And the Israelis were the ones who acted first and rather clever. They made the argument to the first Bush and then later to the Clinton administration that Iran was now the new threat to the region. And particularly once Clinton administration came in, the idea that if you want Israel to take a risk for peacemaking with the Palestinians, the United States then needs to give Israel more space and time by containing and isolating Iran. It was a major shift because only six years earlier the Israelis had gone to Washington with the opposite message. For the Iranians, this was quite a shock. They thought that after the defeat of Saddam, they had quietly helped the U.S. a little bit uh, in that war indirectly. They were thinking that this was the moment for them to come out of the isolation that they had frankly put themselves in because of their radicalism. But instead, the United States doubles down on Iran's isolation and adopts a policy that was called dual containment. The new order in the region would be based on both Iran and Iraq's simultaneous containment and isolation in the region. This was a big blow to the Iranians. They were hoping to be able to in their view, yet regain their, uh, their idea of what their righteous role in the region was. Instead, now, their isolation was going to be intensified. And they did everything they could to undermine the American order in the region. 
including and primarily targeting the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, which they identified as the weakest link in the American-Israeli strategy. If that process collapsed, they believed all of the other major objectives of the United States would also be frustrated in the region. That's why you saw at the time, that's when the real relationship between Iran and Islamic Jihad and Hamas started to take off. But despite everything the Iranians did to caused the collapse of dual containment. It was actually not the Iranians that caused its collapse. It was George W. Bush and the United States itself. By going into Iraq in 2003, by definition, the policy of containment had been put aside, and now instead there was a policy of regime change. The hope, of course, being to replace that old order by making sure that the governments in the region would now be friendly towards the United States, instead of having to deal with containing unhelpful and unfriendly regimes. But instead of being able to establish a new order, the failure of the Iraq war only led to the collapse of the old order, the collapse of dual containment itself. Ever since, and particularly since 2005, the region has essentially been orderless. There is no clear hegemon in the region. There is no constellation of powers that can establish an order and a hegemony. And this is frankly part of the reason why we are seeing so much instability in the region right now, because the region is transitioning from an existing order towards the next order. We haven't reached that end point yet. We're in the transition period. And those transition periods, of course, by definition, tend to be the most volatile uh, periods of a region's lifespan. For the Israelis, and particularly the Saudis, the collapse of dual containment was a significant disaster. They had enjoyed maximum maneuverability in the region as a result of the United States giving them a security umbrella and checking their uh, rival, particularly Iran, and containing and isolating it. Now, instead, the United States had, by taking out the Taliban government in Afghanistan, by taking out Saddam, inadvertently unleashed Iran. Its influence started to grow in the region, its ability and maneuverability grew, and at the same time, the United States, because of the failure in Iraq, weakened itself to the point in which it no longer had the capacity to enforce on the region a new equilibrium. It didn't have the capacity to enforce on the region the containment and isolation of Iran, which it could back in the 1990s. Nevertheless, despite the fact that this was a new geopolitical circumstance that was more favorable towards Iran, the Iranians faced a significant challenge. They could not lock in this new favorable circumstance as long as the United States refused to negotiate with Iran and recognize that Iran was a major power in the region. And precisely for that reason, the Israelis and the Saudis did not want to see any US-Iran diplomacy because if it led to a recognition of Iran, it would essentially signal an end to America's effort to contain and isolate Iran altogether. The irony of it, though, is that both the Israelis and the Iranians pursued or uh, used the same instrument to achieve their opposite objectives, and that was the Iranian nuclear program. From the Israeli perspective, a nuclear program, particularly its enrichment of uranium, that was defined as an existential threat, combined with an Israeli position that ensured that no compromise could be achieved. And that position was zero enrichment. There was no uh, solution that could be acceptable to the Israelis unless the Iranians completely closed down their nuclear program, which was a highly unrealistic objective. The combination of an unrealistic objective and an existential threat essentially ensure that at some point the United States would be forced to take military action against Iran because no compromise was feasible. And the balance of power in the region that would emerge out of that war, the Israelis calculated, would be much more favorable towards Israel. The Iranian calculation was the opposite. Yes, going forward with a nuclear program, aggressively as they did, definitely could risk a military confrontation. But precisely because of war fatigue in the United States, precisely because of the difficulties the United States faced in Iraq and Afghanistan, the vulnerabilities that it had there. Their calculation was that by expanding the program, 
they could also force the United States to change its position on enrichment and accept Iran's enrichment program and come to terms with it by essentially presenting the U.S. with a fait accompli. And this was the crux of the problem for the United States. How do you prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon without going to war, without allowing the Israelis to start a war that you would have to finish, and without allowing any negotiation, any potential negotiation, to lead to a scenario in which the Iranians would be in a strong position to define the new order and the new balance in the Middle East. This was the crux. The strategy of the Bush administration, of course, was that they refused negotiations, uh, and they adopted the zero enrichment objective. The track record of that policy, I think, is quite clear. In 2003, the Iranians had roughly 150 centrifuges. By the time Bush left office, Iran had 8,000 centrifuges. Sorry, they had, yes, they had 8,000 centrifuges. They had zero stockpile of low and rich uranium. This is the material they would use to either uh, create fuel for a reactor or to build a bomb if you enrich it further. By the time Bush left office, the Iranians had 1,500 kilos of heavy Enough to be able to build one bomb. Isolation, refusal to negotiate, zero enrichment, clearly was not working. <laughs> so, when Barack Obama comes into office, it was clear that a shift in strategy was needed. He had already campaigned on the idea of reconstituting diplomacy at the center of American statecraft. This was not just with Iran, it was with Cuba, with Venezuela, but Iran became the poster child. But Obama realized rather quickly that it was one thing to talk about diplomacy with Iran as a state senator from Illinois. It was a completely different matter to actually pursue it as president of the United States. And despite an effort in 2009, a rather short-lived effort to pursue diplomacy, which failed, which was largely because of problems on the Iranian side, within a year, Obama found himself essentially with the same tools at his disposal as Bush had. Sanctions, cyber sabotage, coercion, and other forms of pressure. And still there was something that was quite different. Precisely because Obama had pursued diplomacy, which Bush had not, and precisely because he enjoyed a different degree of international legitimacy compared to Bush, he could achieve what Bush could not, which was assemble the largest sanctions coalition that Iran ever had faced. The sanctions that were imposed on Iran during this period was truly devastating to their economy. The United States even managed to convince the Europeans to cut all oil trade with Iran. Iran was selling 40% of its oil to Europe. It went down to zero. Congress passed, passed sanctions that essentially put sanctions on Iran's central bank, effectively cutting it off of the international financial system. No wires could be done, and still to this day, it's very difficult. The week that that happened, Iran's currency dropped 30%. Over the course of three years, Iran's GDP contracted an estimated 25%. This was absolutely devastating to the Iranians, and the Iranians had clearly underestimated Obama. They never thought such a coalition could be put together. They never thought such a buy-in for sanctions could be achieved. But Obama had also underestimated the Iranians. They were hurting, without a doubt, but they were not breaking, nor were they without a response. If the American strategy and calculation was that we were going to change Iran's cost-benefit analysis by imposing such crippling sanctions so that the Iranians would realize it's just not worthwhile going forward with the nuclear program, it costs too much, and push them to a point in which they would have to choose between having a nuclear program or having an economy. The Iranian calculation was essentially a mirror image of this. They were going to expand the nuclear program in response to the sanctions in order to convince the United States that sanctions were not worth it. So the more the Iranians were sanctioned, the more they expanded the program with the explicit purpose of convincing the United States that sanctions and pressure only begets you a bigger nuclear program. So you had three clocks ticking. 
the Iranian nuclear clock in which they were trying to present the United States with a nuclear fait accompli. The American sanctions clock in which the U.S. was trying to cripple Iran's economy and force it to capitulate on the core issue of uh, enrichment. And the Israeli wild card in which if they had taken military action, they would have completely disrupted it. As these clocks were ticking, there were official negotiations taking place at the P5 plus 1 level, which were not leaning anywhere. And a senator at the time convinced the president that if you really want to get a compromise from the Iranians, if you really want to make sure that we see what sanctions, pressure, etc. can do, we need to start secret channel negotiations directly with Iran's supreme leader. Because it's only in that context that there is any type of a chance that the Iranians would give in. That senator was John Kerry. He had played a key role in utilizing the help of the country of Oman to secure the release of three Americans that had been wrongfully jailed uh, in Iran. I'm sure you all heard about the three American hikers. It's kind of sad because they hiked once and now they're forever known to be the hikers, but they were actually accomplished uh, journalists and English teachers who were in the region. They were actually not stationed in Iraq, they were in Lebanon and, and Syria at the time. They went on a trip to Iraq, to Iraqi Kurdistan, they wanted to go hiking there. And they were in an area close to the Iranian border, but on the Iraqi side. And as they were walking, there was no clear border uh, marked. Uh, they see a couple of soldiers that wave them over. They walk over and unbeknownst to them, they entered Iranian territory. And they were arrested and accused of being spies. The country of Oman helped secure their release, and they did so because they wanted to prove to the United States that Oman has the capacity to navigate this very complex Iranian political landscape. And they wanted to do that because they wanted to convince the United States that the U.S. should use Oman's services to resolve the nuclear program, nuclear standoff, because they were terrified that this would lead to a devastating regional war. The president was convinced, and in July 2012, first time, a secret meeting was held right outside of Muscat. Two American officials, one staff, who were mid-level officials, uh, an equal amount from the Iranian side. And from the American perspective, the purpose of this meeting and this channel was essentially twofold. The U.S. wanted to see, is this truly an authoritative channel that has the blessing of Iran's supreme leader? It was not, no worthwhile spending time if these are people who actually don't have the authority to Secondly, the U.S. wanted to see how close is Iran to capitulate on the issue of enrichment. The Iranians came for a completely different reason. They came to see how close is the United States to capitulate on the issue of enrichment. And as you can imagine, the two sides were talking past each other for a full day, um, not meeting each other in any way, shape, or form, and both sides walked away feeling very disappointed and with a clear assessment that this was a failure and that channel uh, was essentially on life support. Then you had the elections in the United States in November 2012. But by January 2013, a completely different sense of urgency dawned on the White House. Exactly a year earlier, then Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta had publicly stated that Iran's breakout capability is 12 months. That's the amount of time it would take them to make a decision to build a bomb to them having the ready material for a bomb. 12 months. By January 2013, it was the estimation of the U.S. intelligence services that Iran's breakout capability had shrunk to 8 to 12 weeks. Clearly, the Iranian nuclear clock was ticking faster than the American sanctions clock. The president came to the realization that unless something changed, the United States would soon only be faced with two options. Either go to war before that window closed, because if that breakout capability became even shorter, even the military option was no longer an option. Either go to war or accept Iran as a nuclear power. Unless something changed. So two months later, March 2013, two sides go back to Oman for another session. But this time around, the U.S. did not send two diplomats. They sent a full delegation led by then Under Secretary of State Bill Burns, the number two at the State Department, together with a full delegation of non-proliferation experts. 
Iran has sent their deputy foreign minister. But more importantly, for the first time, the U.S. officials were now equipped with an instrument that they had not even been allowed to discuss earlier on. And that was a very carefully crafted message on how and under what circumstances the United States was ready to accept enrichment on Iranian soil. This was exactly what the Iranians had been waiting for. This was their absolute core red line. This was the issue that the Obama administration knew they were going to change their position on at some point. But the plan was to play that card, the most valuable negotiating card the U.S. had, at the end of the negotiations, not at the beginning of the negotiations. Instead now, they had to play it in the beginning because otherwise the risk was that there would not even be a diplomatic path out. But despite the fact that they were now moving much closer on this very central issue of substance, it was not enough for a very simple reason. After 40 years of the U.S. and Iran mutually demonizing each other and having plenty of good reasons not to trust each other, the Iranians could not go back to Tehran with just an oral promise that the U.S. would accept enrichment. They needed it in writing. The American side could not, under any circumstances, put this in writing, because if it leaked, it could create massive problems. First of all, keep in mind, this is all taking place behind the backs of the Europeans, who are suffering through excruciating, meaningless negotiations at the P5 plus 1. And the idea was that if enrichment card was going to be played, it would be played in tandem with the Europeans. Instead, now the US was playing it on its own behind the backs of the Europeans. If this leaked, because it was put in writing, it could collapse those talks. It could also lead to a scenario in which the Iranians would just pocket that concession without getting anything in it. So now you had a problem. Even though they were moving closer to each other, because of the mistrust between the two sides, it still was not enough. The question was, how could this trust gap be bridged? Is there anyone out there that has sufficiently strong relations with the Supreme Leader of Iran and with the President of the United States that could essentially bridge the differences, or at least bridge the gap in trust between the two? Do they have like a common Facebook friend that could step in and resolve this? There was essentially only one person that came to mind, and that was the Sultan of Oman. And the idea emerged that if the United States cannot put this in writing and send it to the Iranians, perhaps the United States can write a letter spelling out its position and send it to the Sultan of Oman. The Sultan would then, in between his chemotherapy, travel to Iran, meet face to face with the Supreme Leader of Iran, not show him the letter, but convey to him its contents. And the calculation being, if the Iranians still rejected it, it wouldn't be because they're expressing mistrust of the United States. They would be expressing mistrust of the Sultan of Oman, a person that they held in very high esteem, which they could not do then calculation was. And that's exactly what happened. Once the Sultan stepped in, through this little uh, maneuver, they managed to overcome 40 years of mistrust, and the issue was, this central issue was resolved, and I will just leave you with this. This all happened while Ahmadinejad was still president. He was not in favor of this, um, and he was not a part of it, but it was all happening before the election of Rouhani. Now, the reason I'd like to tell that story is partly because um, show some of the diplomatic ingenuity that was used in order to be able to get this breakthrough. But also to remind people that in this era where we hear so much about Sunni-Shia divides and about Persian-Arab divides, it was actually an Arab country that brought the United States and Iran closer together, at least on this issue. Secondly, to remind us all that in these very tricky situations, despite the massive power of the United States, it still needs friends in order to be able to overcome deep, deep problems with countries such as Iran and North Korea. And this is particularly important, again, I think, for North Korea, in which the United States is going to have great difficulties being able to resolve this in the absence of having things. Before I stop and open up for q and I just want to leave you all with two last points. Um, the first one is that Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu was just in D.C. last week positioned himself as the foremost opponent of the nuclear deal. And he did so, um, I mean, he even went to the great length of actually speaking in Congress 
um, against the president, which is rather unprecedented move that upset a lot of people on both sides of the aisle. But in some ways, there were one there was one very simple thing that Netanyahu could have done that actually would have achieved his objective of collapsing the individuals. Instead of going to the cameras and saying that this is the worst deal ever, and that this is the deal of the century for the Iranians, and this is the best thing they could have wished for, he should have actually done the opposite. He should have gone there and said, we in Israel love this deal. This is Iran's defeat. This is Iran's capitulation. In an interview with Zarif, the Iranian foreign minister who negotiated it, I asked him, what would you have done if Netanyahu hugged the deal? And he said, we would probably have been forced to walk out of the negotiations. Because it was quite easy for the Iranians to handle Netanyahu saying that this is a horrible deal for the U.S. and a great deal for Iran. If he had come out and said that this is a fantastic deal for Israel and a very bad deal for the Iranians, it would have created massive domestic political problems for the Iranian negotiating team. But in all of his wisdom and all of his efforts, he forgot that by just being a little bit less Netanyahu, Netanyahu could actually have killed this deal. Last point I will leave you with is that we hear a lot of criticism, and I'm happy to take questions as to whether this is a good or a bad deal and various details of it during the Q&A. But we hear a lot of arguments that, look, there was actually a better deal. If we just had sanctions on for another six months or so, we could have gotten a better deal, and we should probably try to renegotiate right now. And the Obama administration's argument that there was no better deal. I actually think there was a better deal. In some ways, from the U.S. perspective, there was a much better deal. But that better deal did not exist in 2015. It existed much earlier. Let me give you a couple of numbers. In 2003, the Iranians had 150 centrifuges, as I mentioned earlier on. They sent a proposal to the Bush administration through the Swiss ambassador in Tehran, in which they offered full-scale negotiation on a whole set of different issues. It was called the Grand Bargain. That included opening up the Iranian nuclear program for full transparency. I was working in Congress at the time. Uh, the Swiss ambassador used to pass by our office every time he came to D.C. every five to six months to give us a briefing because my former boss had lived in Iran, spoke some Persian. And uh, he asked us to make sure that the president would see it because he was afraid that if you just take it to Colin Powell, it might not make it make its way to the president's desk. So we had it sent over to the White House. Within two hours, Paul rolled, called back. He said that he was intrigued, wanted to know if it was authentic. So, to the best of our knowledge, it is. It's coming from the Swiss. Their job has been tasked by the U.S. to uh, shift these messages. That was the last we heard of it. Until about a couple of months later, an article in Financial Times that said that some sort of a comprehensive negotiation proposal was sent by the Iranians through the Swiss, and the Bush administration's response was to reprimand the Swiss ambassador for having delivered it in the first place. We never pursued it. We never knew what could have come out of it. 2005. The last negotiating proposal that the Iranians sent before Ahmadinejad got elected. They offered to cap their program at 3,000 centrifuges. Europeans never sent it to Washington because they knew anything above zero would be rejected, so they didn't even bother sending it. In one of the meetings at the White House, one of our colleagues asked the American negotiators, we were trying to figure out where do you think you're going to end up on this issue of enrichment and centrifuges. So do you think we're going to get something better than the 2005 proposal? And they laughed and said, you know, we would jump on that proposal if it was available today. But that ship has sailed, and we're constantly chasing the deal we could have gotten two years ago. A couple of weeks later, I go to uh, Lausanne, and during one of the rounds of the negotiations, I asked the same question of Zarif. He said, where do you think you're going to land on this? Is it going to be less or more than what you were willing to stop for in, in 2005, which was three and he said, 3,000? Oh, that was just an opening bid. He was the one who wrote this. We would have settled for 1,000. By the time the deal was struck in 2013, the interim deal, the Iranians had 22,000 centrifuges. And they went down as a result of the deal to 5,000 centrifuges, which is a significant reduction. But it's still several thousand more than the opening bid that the Iranians offered in 2005. After a year, a decade of sanctions, we essentially got a program that is much bigger than what it was earlier on. And it's not just the centrifuges, it's not just the LEU stockpile, it's the knowledge that they amassed throughout this period that cannot be reversed. And we did this because we insisted on an outcome that was completely unrealistic. 
I was not alone in pointing out back in 2006 that this will never be achieved. The Iranians will never back down to zero. We lost a decade in which the facts on the ground actually moved better for the Iranians than they did for the United States. And I think this is an important lesson for us to learn, particularly now when we're dealing with countries, again, like North Korea, in which if we combine a strategy that is almost exclusively centered on pressure and sanctions, and we combine it with politically unfeasible objectives, most likely we actually will end up over time weakening our own bargaining position rather than the bargaining position of the other side. I'll stop there and take your questions. Thank you so much. Um, sorry. Okay, uh, questions? I'll take the microphone over. This may be a little bit um, off the topic, but I just want to know why Iran is number one sponsor terrorist. Why uh, everybody in that airplane September 11 was from Saudi Arabia, almost ISIS was built by Saudi Arabia. Why is Iran constantly on the list of, is it because they give money to Hezbollah or other specific terrorist action that Iran has done? That's one. The second thing is, I think this atomic bomb, Iran versus Israel, is a little bit a joke because they are so close to each other. It's like you want to throw a bomb from D.C. to Virginia. I mean, I don't think any of those countries will dare throwing atomic bomb to each other because the proximity is just crazy to me. So has anybody thought about that? Thank you so much. Um, on your first question, I think it is an important question. Um, Iran is continuingly, continuously on the U.S.'s uh, state sponsor of terrorist list as the number one state sponsor. Uh, much of the activities that probably warranted to get onto that list more or less ceased after 2002. But their support for Hezbollah has continued and has grown. And Hezbollah is considered by the United States, not by Europe, uh, as a terrorist organization. But it does raise an important question. Of all of the attacks that have taken place on American soil by terrorist groups killing Americans here in the U.S., they have all been, at least the Islamic, uh, uh, the jihadist organizations, have all been Sunni jihadist organizations with either some form of relationship, whether ideological or financial, uh, with Saudi Arabia, whether it's the government or entities. If you take a look at, for instance, the Muslim ban that was imposed, the travel ban that was imposed last year, it was targeting seven countries originally. Out of those seven countries, not a single citizen had committed a lethal act of terror on the U.S. soil. 94.1% of all victims of terrorism on U.S. soil since 1975 have been at the hands of citizens of Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. None of them were on that list. That's not an argument that they should be on the list, incidentally, because I think the Homeland Security Report is right, that nationality is not an accurate predictor of terrorism. But it does tell us that we have a focus that may have been a little bit too excessive on one side, neglecting very negative developments and behaviors on the other side, which is ultimately coming at our own expense. Um, this, again, does not mean that Iran should be forgiven for some of the things that it has done and some of the things that it continues to do. But from an American perspective, if security is paramount, I think we need to stop neglecting uh, what is coming out of uh, Saudi Arabia and those who are promoting Wahhabi Islam uh, and, and that form of jihadism. As to your second question, uh, the distance between Iran and Israel is actually still quite significant. That's not an argument that it makes sense for them to have a nuclear war. I don't think it makes a sense at all uh, for them to have it. But um, perhaps a more important aspect of this is that um, the Iranians know very well that unlike them, Israel has a second strike capability. Which means, because they have nuclear equipped uh, German built submarines. Which means, as one Israeli official told me, whatever Iran does to destroy Israel, Iran will never be able to destroy Israel's capacity to destroy Iran in turn. So it would be completely suicidal and irrational for them to do anything of that kind. Of course, they would first have to have nuclear weapons, which they don't. 
Um, and I think when you talk to Israeli officials, and I, I wrote my dissertation on Iranian Israeli relations, it was very fascinating to me that the questions they all asked me was nevertheless premised on the idea that deterrence does work with Iran, because that's exactly how their policy is. And if we depart from what I think is a rather inaccurate assumption that the Iranians are irrational, then we have to explain how is it that an irrational, supposedly suicidal regime has gone and become as powerful as it ever has been if it truly was irrational and suicidal. It doesn't sound to me like the track record of a suicidal and irrational state. It doesn't mean that their policies are good or stabilizing. It just means that they are quite self-interested. They're very, very calculating. And one of the biggest mistakes we have committed in the West, in my view, is to underestimate. Thank you for a, a marvelous presentation. One of the estimates back when the Iran-Iraq nuclear deal was signed was that Iran would benefit by repatriating, if you will, about $150 billion in sequestered by the international banking system. I wonder if you could uh, give us your opinion on how much money actually returned to Iran, which was money that they had earned through their tanker oil business and so forth. And secondly, how much of that money actually went back into the local economy, and how much of that money was devoted to increasing Iran's capability within the region and its desires to become the regional hegemon? Excellent question. If I could take a step back and, uh, and reference, because I think the question was very accurate in presenting what has happened. Uh, there's been a far less accurate way of describing it, which is that the United States gave Iran $150 billion uh, of its money. That was never the case. We're talking about roughly $150 billion of Iranian money that was in various international banks, Switzerland, Japan, etc., which they were using to finance their um, uh, imports. As a result of the sanctions that the United States imposed, all of those banks essentially froze Iran's access to its own money. As an incentive to the Iranians to agree to cut down their nuclear program from 22,000 centrifuges to 5,000, they regained access technically to that money. But reality is they have not been able to shift that money back because the banks are still not okay with wiring the money back to Iran because they're still afraid that they're going to be sanctioned by the United States and by Congress. So according to the U.S. intelligence, and this was just a hearing, I believe, last yesterday, uh, Congressman asking uh, about this issue, the U.S. intelligence estimate is that most of that money remains in those banks. They're continuing to use it for uh, their, their imports, uh, and that they have simply not been able to take that money back to Iran. They could not um, conclusively say that none of that money has been able to benefit some of their other activities, but the overwhelming amount of it is actually still in those banks. I can hear you, but it's not You can hear me, okay. Well, no, 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 it's not. Well, first of all, um, just an overall, your wonderful presentation. It really makes a strong case for diplomacy, which unfortunately seems to be in very short supply with an emasculated State Department these days. But moving from there, um, your response about terrorists and being mostly from Saudi Arabia, you know, terrorists on U.S. soil have not been from Iran. But, and I know you know this because I've read your articles, that what you didn't mention is that Iran has attacked U.S. interests, primarily in Iraq with Iraq, you know, the Iraqi militias, which have been trained in Iran by, you know, Soleimani has been very active in Iran, he's a of its force, and so, though it hasn't been on U.S. soil, U.S. interests overseas have been attacked and, you know, U.S. personnel have been killed by, you know, Iranian militias. Moving on from there, I was... Can I just pause one thing? I think that's an absolutely accurate point. The reason I didn't bring that up is because I don't know what definition of terrorism to use, but the usual definition of terrorism is that you deliberately target civilians. U.S. personnel in Iraq are not civilians. But, okay, fair enough. But embassy bombings in different parts of the country. All right, well, we'll move on from that. The other thing that struck me, and I'm going to 
or it was the Israeli position that uh, the treaty was not about enrichment. Because I think the way a lot of Americans have pushed it is to say, you have to look at it strictly as a nuclear treaty, which means we are not giving Iran, you know, free range over other issues and we're going to hold their foot to the fire for, you know, Hezbollah and for all these other issues. So we're not giving them a free pass. And that's how, when Congress was, you know, trying to nullify it, we used the fact that it's a nuclear agreement the same way we did with the Russians. So, or with the Soviets using the soft agreement. Um, you're quite right. This was from the administration's perspective. This, and we have to keep in mind, that reference is from April 2012. That's before you actually had the real diplomacy taking off. It was only taking place at the P5 plus 1 level, which wasn't going anywhere at the time. The concern from the Israeli side that they were worried about is not that the nuclear issue wasn't important to them. I think it was. It was far more important to them than it was to the Saudis. To the Saudis, the, the mere thing was really the concern that there would be some form of rapprochement between the United States and Iran. But what came out of that meeting, and there were more things that I unfortunately couldn't share in the book about that meeting, I was there, um, was that the main primary concern was that the United States would essentially acquiesce to the fact that Iran is a major power as by virtue of it having a nuclear program that gave it leverage to negotiate. And that as a result of that, the United States would just completely shift its position in the region. It would not be a full back of Israel because it would be too concerned about keeping that nuclear deal. I think there's a lot of validity to what the Israelis were concerned about. The conversation I had at that meeting afterwards with some of the Israelis is to say, I think Israel is committing a mistake. Once you have come to the conclusion that you cannot stop this because the President of the United States is committed to finding a solution because he doesn't want to go to war if it can be avoided. You have to shift your position from having opposed diplomacy to actually try to come into the tent and try to impact how the shape and contours of that diplomacy is going to be. The problem the Israelis have is that their Prime Minister was Netanyahu, someone who for 20 years had come to personify the argument that Iran is an existential threat. He did not have the political maneuverability to be able to shift his position and say, well, now we're going to have a compromise with this existential threat. Had it been Ehud Barak or someone else from the Israeli side who had been on record since 1992 saying Iran is a threat, but not an existential threat. It's an insult to Israel to say that Iran is an existential threat because it diminishes Israel's power. Had someone like that been in power, I think the Israelis would have far greater maneuverability to be um, influential in the negotiations. Because at least up until... Um, up until the JPOA, to November 2013, the US did everything to include the Israelis. When Wendy Sherman conducted a round of talks, before she went back to Washington to debrief her colleagues there, she flew through Ben Gurion and she briefed the Israelis. Once US intelligence revealed that the Israelis were selectively leaking information from the negotiations in order to undermine them, that's when the US stopped providing those briefings. But from the outset, the U.S. and the Obama administration tried to include the Israelis in order to be able to get their buy. -in. And with a different administration, with a different relationship, because it's not just Netanyahu, the, the, the chemistry between him and Obama was just very, very negative, that couldn't happen. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of very interesting insight into the negotiations. And a question related to the negotiations. Implicit in your lecture and your answer to my predecessor on the questions is that at least on the part of the Israeli government, despite all of the public discussions about Iran's time to break out, its ability to pursue a nuclear weapon, was an understanding that the Iranian government really wasn't interested in pursuing a nuclear weapon. Uh, was that, what basis did the United States government have to have concerns about Iran actually pursuing a nuclear weapon, if any. And then the question about the background that you spoke of, about the Iranians feeling pressure to walk away if the Israelis embrace the agreement. To what extent does that domestic pressure that the Iranian government would have felt have to do with Iranian nuclear ambitions that predated the Islamic Revolution? Excellent question. If I start with the second one, it's very important, actually, because the nuclear program in Iran 
uh, predated the Islamic Republic. It was started under the time of the Shah, uh, to a very large extent because of encouragement from the United States as part of the Adams for Peace program. Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld were quite involved in trying to convince the Iranians, and the Shah in particular, that Iran could not be a modern country without a nuclear program. Uh, a central reactor that was the uh, basis of the negotiations in 2009, the, the short-lived negotiations that I skipped over in my presentation, uh, the TRR, the Tehran Research Reactor, was given to the Iranians by the United States as a gift in 1967. And the Shah actually had a very clear strategy in which he did not want to build a weapon, but he wanted to get as close as possible. So he had the option and only build it if the security environment around Iran were to deteriorate. Part of the reason for this was because he had been convinced by an American ambassador <coughs> that the United States under no circumstance would go to war with Soviet Union over Iran. Iran was not a member of NATO. It did not have security. And as a result, the Shah felt that he needed to have that option in case the security environment were to continue. Once the Islamic Republic comes into power, at first they close down the program. Um, Ayatollah Khomeini himself had um, a, a religious and ideological opposition to the idea of weapons of mass destruction. It was restarted later on, uh, towards the end of his life. And essentially what they did, which is very common with what the Islamic Republic has done, is that they took the blueprints of the plan, of the strategy that the Shah had put in place, twinkled some Islamic words and names on it, and made it look as if it was their own. But in essence, it's pretty much the same blueprint as the Iranians had prior to the revolution. If you could remind me what your first question was. What was the objective basis of any ah. that the United States had for thinking that Iran was actually pursuing nuclear Sure. There was a basis. There was an important basis because there were uh, experimentation that the Iranians had conducted prior to 2003 that are highly suspicious, that go beyond what can be said is purely peaceful activities. And this was actually one of the trickiest parts at, towards the end of the negotiations in the sense that what do you do with these past violations? Um, if you completely forgive them, what does that say? If you make a big deal out of them and you actually collapse the, the, the nuclear deal, then you're essentially, uh, essentially exchanging the opportunity to prevent the bomb in the future by being insistent on punishing them for a past violation. And the way that issue was resolved was that the Iranians would give full uh, access to the IEA to make its estimation. But the estimation would essentially only come to the conclusion as to whether the IA is content and can close the file or not. Not to actually draw a final conclusion. And this was something that also a lot of people criticized. And it was essentially, what do you do? Do you go back and punish them for something that happened 10 years ago? And, and by that, risk collapsing the deal altogether? Or do you find a way to resolve that issue without having a full resolution but an opportunity to but so that's one part of it. The other part of it that is also important is that unlike some of the other countries, such as Israel, Israel never signed an non-proliferation treaty. India never signed an non-proliferation treaty. Pakistan never signed an non-proliferation treaty. So as a result, they have not agreed to be subjected to the rules of the NPT. Iran was one of the first signatories of the NPT. And that gave the United States and the world a legal basis to be able to say we have to address this issue because you are part of this agreement and you have violated it. This is also part of the reason why the United States is on very shaky ground going after Iran's missile program. Because there is no international agreement that the Iranians have signed that would give the rest of the world the right to uh, regulate Iran's missiles. And it was also a very shaky ground for the United States to insist on zero enrichment. Because the interpretation of the Article 4 of the NPT the vast majority of countries believe that that does mean that a country that pursues a peaceful program has an inalienable right to pursue enrichment technology. It is the minority position of the West and the United States that says that is not included. And, and again, this was part of the reason why the United States early on had a great difficulty getting a sanctions coalition against Iran for the mere activity of enrichment. The biggest opponents were countries like, like Brazil. We're not talking about allies of Iran. Countries like Brazil, who have a very expensive, expansive nuclear program, 
were terrified that the United States was going to change the rules of the NPT and put a, a, a predicate by having a punishment against Iran. But if nothing was done, there was a valid risk of being concerned that much of the NPT would fall apart because Iran was a signatory, and if it then went to build a nuclear weapon, it would be a big blow to the Iran. Things. My name is Puran Nooruzi. I just want to tell you something. You know, I'm Iranian. Now, as you know, majority of Iranians are very, very educated and they're very well in the United States. But they make the atmosphere that I hesitate to say I'm Iranian. That's not right, you know. Honestly, very often I hesitate to say I'm Iranian. And, but I, mean, I should be proud to be able to say I'm because they are all doing very well here. I agree with you more. So here's the issue of the future, which is what do you see or what do you think would be the right course to pursue rather than looking so skeptically as people are now um, and the word decertification and those things that would make us very sad? That's a very important question because that issue is going to be on the forefront of people's minds in the next couple of weeks. When a new deadline emerges in which the president has to make a decision whether he continues to stay inside the deal or not. I think it's important to recognize that in its simplest form, the deal prevented two very negative outcomes. The outcome of the Iranians having a pathway to a bomb and a, new, and a war with Iran. If this deal collapses, there are good reasons to believe that those two bad outcomes come back onto the table, and most probably in a worse way than it was before, because at least before, when you look at the options the President looked at in January 2013, and he realized that despite the sanctions, it wasn't tough enough to be able to reverse Iran's nuclear program, and that he would be faced with either accepting Iran as a nuclear state or going to war. At least he had the option of saying, I can change something. I can go back to the table and I can play that card that I was saving for the end of the negotiation. I want to play it at the beginning of the negotiation. If we have a deal, that not only seven countries were part of Russia, China, France, Germany, the UK, and Iran. And that was adopted by the UN Security Council 15 to 0. And we violate it. We walk out of it. There is most likely no pathway back to the policy. We don't have the credibility of being able to say, let's go back to the policy. And that leaves us only with those two options. And I think that's a very, very dangerous situation. And I think a lot of folks are not recognizing these consequences because the talking points of this is about completely different things. This is not a fair deal and things of that nature. Let me give you another as aspect of this that I'm very worried about. I'm a big proponent of diplomacy, so please don't take this the wrong way. I'm not saying we should not have diplomacy with North Korea. But if we end up having diplomacy with North Korea, if we end up striking a deal with North Korea and we keep the deal with North Korea, I'm afraid the Iranians are going to conclude, you know what? Iran's problem, and, and we kill the deal with Iran, Iran is going to conclude Iran's mistake was that it only had enrichment. It should have built the bomb, because then it would have gotten America's respect, and they would have been able to get a deal, and the U.S. would have honored it. We don't want to do something that incentivizes these countries to actually build nuclear weapons. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all.